In 1991, Dis Walt Disney Pictures um, released what was, has become a real classic called The Beauty and the Beast. And The Beast, The Beauty and the Beast, it focuses on this relationship between a beast, who is a prince, who's been magically transformed into a monster, and his servants into household objects as punishment for his arrogance. And Belle, a young woman who he imprisons in his castle so that he can become a prince again. And to break the curse, the beast must learn to love Belle and earn her love and return before the last petal falls from the enchanted rose, or else he'll remain a beast forever. In the Disney version of Beauty and the Beast, Belle is an intelligent, strong-willed beauty who falls for a man who has been cursed to look like a beast. And despite the curse, the beast she sees within him caring eyes and a soft interior and a fierce devotion, devotion to her. In between all the singing dishes with twirling through candlelit ballrooms, impromptu snowball fights, the couple falls deeply in love. And Beauty and the Beast gets a fairy tale ending when their love breaks the curse and the two live happily ever after in the castle. But the real life couple that inspired that story did not get a fairy tale ending, and there was no curse to break. The beast had to live with his condition for his entire life. And the real life beauty and the beast were Catherine and Petrus Gonsalves, and they were treated like freaks of nature by Europe's kings and queens. Petrus the beast was born with a condition that covered his face and hair. And when he was just 10 years old, he was locked in a cage and treated like an animal. And Lady Catherine was tricked by the evil queen into marrying him. She did not even meet him until the wedding day. And in the story, Catherine and Petrus, there was no fairy tale ending. The king at the time declared that Petrus could receive an education, and so he shocked the court by becoming fluent in Latin and learning noble etiquette, and worked hard to disprove stereotypes about beasts. He became an important in the court, an important person in the court. But despite his improved treatment, he was still seen as less than human, a freak of nature. And after King Henry's death, the mother, his mother Catherine, arranged a marriage for him. But she decided not to tell the future bride about his condition. Queen Catherine found her beauty in a young maiden who was also named Catherine. And when the King Catherine announced to the maiden that she would soon wed, there was no way to reject the Queen's arranged marriage. Catherine's reaction to her husband's appearance was not recorded. But what was recorded was that over time, the two cared for each other and were married for over 40 years. While the fairy tale version ends with the beauty and the beast happily wed in real life, no one really knows exactly what happened to Catherine and Petrus. After being shuffled from one court to another, they eventually settled in a small town in Italy, and Catherine died in 1623, but there was no record given of Petrus' death. And so what does this story have for us? You know, it brought me back to a memory that I hold dear in my life. Several years ago, I met what I have come to call a beauty. My partner, Jerry, for many years has taught an art class for adults with um, brain health issues. And on this brisk evening in October, he invited me to come to his class. And when I walked into the class, the first person I met was Megan. She asked me what my name was and then repeated my name and said, Welcome, Dave. You know, there's always something that occurs inside of us when we hear our own name. 
We get that really kind of pleasing feeling. And this evening was no different. And as the evening went on, I watched Megan as she reached out to everyone in the class. And after the class, she introduced me to her boyfriend, and his name was Greg, and he also attended the class, and he greeted me in the same friendly manner. Both adults had some physical disformities, but that night, I was able to see past those, see the spirit that was inside. Throughout the years, as I, whenever I can, I try to attend Jerry's classes because it helps to remind me of the things that are most important of people, of spirits, of looking on the inside and not always judging by what we see on the outside. Megan has become my beauty to remind me of that. The writer John Donahue stated, the human soul is hungry for beauty. When we experience the beautiful, there is a sense of homecoming. Some of our most wonderful memories are beautiful places where we felt immediately at home. We feel most alive in the presence of the beautiful, for it meets the needs of our soul. How many of you have gone for a walk and caught the sun as it was just coming up, or as it was just going down? The shadows that it casts in the stillness of the morning or the darkness of the night. This has always been a sense of beauty to me and always has served as a way to calm my soul. One of the huge confessions in our times is to mistake glamour for beauty. When I think of the word beauty, some of the faces of those that I love come into mind. When I think of beauty, I also think of beautiful landscapes. Then I think of acts of such lovely kindness that have been done to me by people who cared for me in bleak, unsheltered times or when I needed to be loved, when I needed to be held. I also think of those unknown people who are the real heroes for me. Those who were on the frontiers of an awful situation and managed somehow to go beyond the given impoverishment and offer gifts of possibility and imagination and seeing. Each of us in our lives needs someone like a Belle from the Disney story. I feel so blessed to have such a person in my life partner. I want you to know that as I do my best to honor this calling as your minister, that Jerry is not very far away. Each day as we chat with each other and I share my joys, my concerns, my frustrations. He asks about you. He wants to know how you are. And in listening to him, I gain a better understanding of how to minister to each of you. It's not an easy task to be a minister. And I realized when I came here that I would be replacing someone that you grew to love, someone that you grew to look at. And I am not Michael, I am Reverend Dave, but I respect him for what he did, for the legacy that he left. And hopefully, in working with you, I will be more like a beauty and not so much like a beast. (laughs) I've got to admit, it's kind of beautiful and selfless. I know there's a lot of controversy in what the word beauty means. But let me tell you what I think is beautiful. I find the action of realizing differences a completely extraordinary, beautiful event. And as I've been here and got to know you and your differences, I find it to be a thing of beauty, and I applaud you, because out of those differences, we come to grow. We come to be all that we can, and we cast a beautiful light on our faith, on this congregation, 
and on each other. It's amazing to me the acceptance we show one another during our hard times. We agree that we are different, but in those times of trial, differences of race, color, everything go away and we unite in helping each other. I tend to believe that if you try too hard to find beauty in things, you will never find it. Beauty is not the thing that you suddenly found in an old friendship. Beauty is the friendship. And many times we take it for granted. Most of the time when people look for beauty and do not find it, it is because of two reasons. They don't seem to know where to start looking or they don't know what they're looking for. And that's the beauty of it. You don't have to look for it. It's there. It's there in the small child crying on a plane, in your friend who constantly laughs at your bad jokes or your puns, or in a quiet walk in the morning. Beauty is in the fact that I can share my thoughts with you and you being able to nod your head and agree or disagree. So where can beauty be found? The most likely broadened answer would be that beauty is in the eye of beholder. We've all heard that. And according to the Google definition, the phrase originated from a proverb with the intention being that beauty cannot be judged objectively. For what one person finds beautiful or admirable may not appeal to another. For me, there exists the potential for beauty to be in all things. It may not take a bit of determination or simply a different perspective or a mindset or a vantage point, but if beauty is being searched for, it can be found. Our aim as a congregation ought to be making us more aware, more appreciative, and more grateful for the beauty we've been blessed with and the beauty that surrounds us. So where do you find beauty? What is beautiful to you? Each of us have beauty inside, but we also have a beast. And there's an inner beast hiding in all of us. Some just disguise it better than others. Even though the beast lets the bad side take over, he or she eventually starts making better choices that end up quelling our nasty nature. In the Disney story, Beauty and the Beast, the Beast's biggest enemy lay within himself. His selfish, spoiled, rotten demon was responsible for the curse that cast over his castle and his kingdom. It took some tough love from Baal for him to quit pitting himself and to get a new outlook on life. Unfortunately, we don't all have a bell to help us to see the air of our ways. And sometimes, we just need to take a time out and look inside ourselves to discover if we're the reason why we're not happy. Sometimes it takes time, patience, and an open mind to see what someone's heart is truly made of. This is what seeing beauty can do. Beauty awakens and admonishes us. We are here in this religious community not to hide from the anguish cries of the tender lullabies. We are here in this religious community not to protect our hearts from breaking. We are here together to borrow courage for the task of coming alive. We are here so that together we might need the admissions of beauty, answering the call to create, protect, and preserve so part of recognizing beauty, I believe, is to act. And so I ask you to do this one thing. If you don't have someone by you, turn to someone beside you or to the, in back of you. But I want you to say that person's name. And then I want you to say, I'm glad you are here and you are beautiful.
And you know, you are all beautiful. We are beautiful. Remember this. Where beauty is apparent, we are to enjoy it. Where there is beauty hidden, we are to unveil it. Where there is beauty defaced, we are to restore it. And where there is no beauty at all, we are to create it. May it be so. Thank you.